Hello. So let's get into the last chapter of um, this test, exam number three. We've got chapter 18, the respiratory system. Get some notes out. Ready to take notes. Um, so the process of respiration has three steps. We have breathing, also called pulmonary ventilation, uh, the flow of air into and out of the lungs. We have external respiration and internal respiration. External near internal. So external is the changing of the gases in the lungs, for example, oxygen and CO2 in the blood cells, and internal is changing of the gases in the tissues. So when our cells and the tissues need that oxygen and release CO2 and they go back through the veins and back into the heart and to the lungs. Okay, so it's so got a structural component of the respiratory system. So we have what's called the upper respiratory and the lower respiratory. So the upper respiratory, the nose, nasal cavity, and the pharynx. Um, the lower respiratory, the larynx, the trachea, bronchi, and the lungs. So why is this important? Because there's some disease or there's some viruses that um, cause lower respiratory infections or upper respiratory infections. And the lower respiratory infections are the ones that are much more deadly and more difficult to deal with because they're all the way to the bottom and they, they deal with all the gas exchanges and the lungs and and the alveoli and all those things down there. So it's it's harder to treat or um, and to, to kind of deal with than the upper respiratory, which are on the upper area, I guess you can say. Okay, um, the main components of that system or respiratory system, we got the conducting zone, which is basically the tubes or the cavities like around uh, this area, I guess you can say. <laughs> we got the nose, nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles uh, and the terminal bronchioles all the way down to the lungs. And uh, that's a conducting zone. And now the respiratory zone uh, is where the gas exchange occurs with the bronchioles, alveolar ducts, the sacs, and the alveoli. Okay. So the two zones, conducting where air is conducted in and out and respiratory where the gas exchange occurs. Um, the respiratory system includes the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, trachea, the bronchi, and the lungs, uh, provides for intake of O2 and removal of CO2. Um, it also helps regulate blood pH, uh, releases ions, H plus ions, regulate pH, contains receptors in the nose for smell, filters our little hairs, trying to filter in there, trying to keep stuff away, produces sound in our throat, um, rids the body of some water and heat, um, Otorinolaryngology. Otorinolaryngologo. Obviously in Spanish, it's always hard. Anyways, all right, um, so here they are, just uh, different organs. We got the nose, um, the external uh, nasal cavities. Um, we have the larynx, the pharynx, the trachea, bronchus, um, and the lungs. And we have this little, little cavity or this little section here where the heart goes. That's why it kind of looks like that. It's pretty cool. Um, and we'll, we'll see that in another picture as well. Okay. Um, so here's more of a real life picture. Well, not real life, but a real person picture. We have the larynx, thyroid gland in there. Pretty cool. The trachea, um, arteries, carotid artery, brachiocephalic artery, the arch of the aorta in here, the heart over here, vena cava here on the left. Um, the right lung, the left lung, see other different shapes, and that's that's normal. It happens like that, having that little different shape, because that's where the heart kind of fits in. Um, so yeah. All right. Um, the nose, specialized organ at the entrance. Um, it's middle cartilage and skin, and it has mucous membrane in there to kind of clean stuff out. That's not supposed to be in our body. The opening is the external nares. Um, and then the inside, it's kind of like split by the nasal septum, communicates with the paranasal sinuses, the nasal pharynx, uh, through the internal nares inside as well. Um, the nose is adapted for warming, moistening, filtering air, olfaction or smell, and resonating chamber. The pharynx, uh, funnel tube tube, uh, funnel shaped tube. That was, that was bad. Um, and internal nares and expands part way down the neck, posterior to the nasal and oral cavities, anterior to the cervical vertebrae. Uh, its walls made of skeletal muscle with mucous membrane. 
Um, the pharynx is passageway for air and food. Uh, it is divided into the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. So nasopharynx in respiration or breathing, oropharynx and laryngopharynx in digestion and respiration as well. Okay, so here's the big picture of all those things that we just talked about, the little different organs. We have uh, here the internal nares, the nasopharynx up here, the oropharynx right here, laryngopharynx right here, the larynx, um, the esophagus starting down here, the trachea here in the front, um, thyroid gland right here in the front as well, uh, that little butterfly we saw earlier, tonsils, the tongue. So yeah, this is your, your little image of the organs, the respiratory organs. Okay, uh, we also have the larynx or the voice box, uh, the thyroid cartilage, the epiglottis, the cricoid cartilage, the arid, aridinoid cartilage, the false vocal cords, and the true vocal cords. So pitch um, is a sound because of vibrations or tensions in the vocal folds. Uh, they vibrate more rapidly and have a higher pitch. And when you vibrate less rapidly, they have a lower pitch. Okay. Now we have the trachea. And it sends from the larynx to the primary bronchi. And it's made of a smooth muscle and little C-shaped rings of cartilage. Um, here it is. So we have our little thyroid cartilage or the Adam's apple. This one's pretty cool. The epiglottis in here. This leaf and the stem, the attachment to to move between the, the uh, to what goes into our esophagus or what goes into our lungs. It's like a little um, thyroid gland, parathyroid glands, the little C-shaped cartilage is that we got in there as well. Okay. Um, then the trachea will then divide into the right and left bronchus that goes to right or left lung. Um, then they'll divide into secondary bronchi and into segmental bronchi and into the bronchioli. So they'll kind of like branch out as a tree. Um, and they have the smallest two, so the terminal bronchioles. Um, and then that's why it's known as a bronchial tree. We'll get into that. So all the way at the bottom is we have that little gas exchange as well. Okay. Um, the lungs have a pleural membrane, membrane um, the parietal Pleura is the outer, the visceral is the inner. Um, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes, um, and it has that cardiac notch. So a little section, the little opening where the heart goes. Each lobe consists of lobules, which contain some vessels, some lymph vessels to, to clean out. It's not supposed to be there. Arterioles, venules, terminal bronchioles, uh, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, sacs and I'll be all right. So uh, the exchange of gas in the, in the, the change of gas in the lungs occurs through the respiratory membrane. So we'll get into pictures of that. So here we are, we have our trachea in the middle, uh, right lung, left lung, and then uh, right main bronchus, left main bronchus, and then uh, the lobber bronchus, uh, segmental bronchus, uh, bronchioles, um, yeah, and terminal bronchioles all the way at the bottom. Terminal, terminal bronchioles. Okay, uh, see that little cardiac notch? So that's where our heart goes. That's why your, the real image we saw is is normal that the heart, that the, the left lung looks like that because that's where our heart sits. It's to give it a little section to, to be at. Okay. So here we are, the conducting zone. Remember where it just it goes through in and out. And the respiratory zone where we got that gas exchange occurring. So here's the image as well. So we went all the way down to the terminal bronchioli. So that's all the way at the end, at the end, at the end, the little ones. At the end, we have the arteries, veins, uh, lymph vessels, um, pulmonary capillaries. Then we have the alveoli, like little grapes. Um, and then the alveolar sac and the alveoli. Um, so here, this whole thing is a sac, and each one individual is an alveoli. We'll get into how the gas exchange occurs too. Here it is. Um, this is pretty cool. Cool section picture. So we have seen red. We have on the left uh, the ve the arteries or the vessels or the blood where where the red the red blood cells are traveling through. So these um, type one alveolar cells. That's where most of the gas exchange occurs. 
So you have your vessels there, so you're going to diffuse through the membrane. So oxygen will diffuse into the red blood cells, and CO2 will diffuse out of the red blood cells. Okay, remember the uh, arteries carry the, ox the oxygen or the red blood cells with oxygen. The veins carry the red blood cells without, um, without oxygen or with CO2. Okay, little macrophage is trying to clean up dust around there. Uh, pulmonary capillaries, membranes, type 2, kind of moisten up those areas in the lungs so it's not all dry. Um, but yeah, here's a little alveolar, type 1 alveolar cell, and you have that little gas exchange occurring through that. It's super important. We filter our blood, get some oxygen into our tissues and all over. Okay, so here's another picture, diagrams in uh, microscopes. More detail, type 1 alveolar, macrophages cleaning up. Type 2 alveolar, kind of moistening up, um, alveolar wall, the alveoli, those gaps in there that you can see, um, and the macrophages. Cool microscope pictures. All right, now we got pulmonary ventilation or breathing. So that's a flow of air uh, between the atmosphere and the lungs, um, and it's because of differences in pressure. Okay, so when we inhale, the pressure inside is less than the pressure outside. So we're trying to take some air in to kind of even out the pressure. But now that we took that in, our pressure inside is higher. Now we exhale to decrease the pressure to the outside. Okay, so to do that, we need to contract and relax certain muscles to be able to create or increase that lung volume and create that pressure change. Okay, um, so basically the diaphragm will contract, um, receives nerve impulses or signals from the phrenic nerves coming in down tells the diaphragm contract, uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscles around there, the scalenes and pectoralis minors contribute to forced inhalation. So just regular inhalation, the diaphragm contracts but to force. And that's when all these muscles in the chest, scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, they start working to help breathe in forcefully. <coughs> Not a lot of air in. <laughs> um, and then forced exhalation or breathing out uh, it involves the contraction mainly of the abs and the sides of the ribs, uh, external oblique, internal oblique, um, the other other muscles associated with. So some help out in contracting to get air in, and some help out contracting to let air out. Okay, so we have different formulas um, or numbers for long volumes. We have tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, residual volume. So basically, your tidal volume is your normal breathing. Just take a normal breath. Inspiratory reserve is when you take a deep, deep breath and you get in as much, as much, as much as you can. Expiratory reserve is when you take a deep, deep breath out and take out as much, as much as you can. And then that leftover is that residual volume that's just in there. Okay. Um, lung capacities are combinations of specific lung volumes. Okay. So here it is. Um, a diaphragm right here, kind of like a little line of diaphragm in there. So it's going to contract. Um, these obliques right here, abdominis, are going to help exhale. Remember, um, these muscles are going to help. in. So they contract. So when they contract, they increase the lung volume. So they're able to let the lungs expand. And then when they release, they kind of contract the lungs themselves. And they're able to ex exhale the gas. Okay. Um, so this is just talking about pressure. Um, and it's pretty pretty simple it's just putting they're putting it in big words but um so when there's like, like when the rest when the diaphragm is relaxed uh the pressure inside or outside is the same so alveolar is like pressure inside the lungs um atmospheric pressure outside they're the same then um when we're trying to breathe in or inhale um the alveolar pressure drops so air flows into the lungs trying to get that pressure to go up. And then when we breathe out, we're trying to get that pressure to go down. So whatever there is more pressure, um, the, the air is gonna flow the other way around. So breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. More pressure, less pressure, more pressure, less pressure. That's how kind of how it works. Um, here is a little spirogram I just showed. So these little lines in the middle, your tidal volume, remember it's just a regular breathing. Uh, once you take a big, big inhalation, so that's your inspiratory reserve. You take a lot of air in, oxygen in. And then when you exhale, and you exhale forcefully, that's your expiratory reserve. 
and you still have that residual volume so what's left over of everything that you inhaled or were able to take in okay it's a little spider to kind of determine the breathing um, averages how many milliliters um, why when you get tests if your breathing is wrong then that means there's some sort of problem around that area on the respiratory system that we need to probably focus on okay so you're kind of like eliminating so many different areas imagine as a doctor just eliminating all kinds of stuff around it when you know the breathing is wrong maybe something around there um, is causing the problem okay now the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide I think I'm going a little fast so feel free to pause it break it down okay um, so air has a lot of gases we got nitrogen oxygen water vapor co2 and there's many others um, and each one contributes to the total air pressure but uh, we call partial pressure when you specifically focus on one of the gases so partial pressure of oxygen partial pressure of nitrogen partial pressure of co2 okay so there's different uh, pressures we got external and internal respiration so that's exchanging of gases okay um, external respiration is the exchange in the lungs um, internal respiration is the exchange between the tissues or the capillaries and the cells so the oxygen going into the cells and the co2 coming out of the cells the external is uh, kind of filling out those red blood cells um, with oxygen okay um, so here's a little chart let me move this around um, so just looking at this little graph okay um, so remember blue has no co2 so look at the pressure of oxygen and co2 um, when through our veins when it comes in um, to the lungs uh, to the alveoli we got that mixture uh, co2 is exhaled o2 comes in now the alveolar air has way more o2 so the pressure is higher than the co2 then the blood or oxygenated blood travels through the arteries the pressure is higher in oxygen but once it releases it to the tissues different areas of the tissues then obviously the pressure of oxygen is going to go down because it's losing its oxygen and it's gaining co2 from the cells so what's being used it's been recycled so now the pressure of co2 is going to be higher than oxygen come back to the heart come back to the lungs to get more oxygen now that pressure increases come back to the tissues release the oxygen now that pressure decreases okay so it's just a little cycle of uh, when you exchange oxygen and co2 throughout uh, the body um, all right, let me move this now um, the blood transport gases between the lungs and our body tissues um, about 99.5 percent of the blood is bound to hemoglobin which is a protein in those red blood cells uh, the association of oxygen is affected by the partial pressure of oxygen, by the pH, by the temperature, and by the partial pressure of CO2. So depending how much or the oxygen attaches to hemoglobin, we got these factors that affect it. Okay, uh, we got carbon dioxide that's transported. Uh, some of it is dissolved in plasma. Some of it combines with globin of hemoglobin, and some of it is converted into bicarbonate ions. Okay, so three ways to release or transport that CO2. Okay, uh, so when you add, so basically when you add more ions, you're able to release water um, and use and carbon dioxide. Okay, so here we have, um, it's also pretty much the same chart we just looked at, but now it says hemoglobin with CO2 uh, or attached to it, and then we kind of split it up. CO2 leaves, hemoglobin stays in the red blood cell. Now oxygen comes in. Now hemoglobin with oxygen. And the erythrocyte comes down same thing but oxygen leaves hemoglobin itself co2 comes in to the hemoglobin attaches and it comes to the heart to the lungs again so pretty much the same cycle okay but now adding hemoglobin hb and co2 in it um, the respiratory center uh, is split into two sections we got the medullary respiratory center and the pontine respiratory uh, group which is in the pons okay um, so basically the pontine kind of is able to alter the basic rhythm patterns or breathing patterns that we have. Um, respirations or breathing can be modified by many factors, um, cortical influences, chemoreceptors, limbic system, proprioceptors, temperature, pain, airways, uh, stretch receptors. So many things can alter and influence our breathing or respiration. 
Okay, so we need a control center for breathing. Um, so the locations, here's the pons, here's the pontine respiratory, and the medulla oblongata, so the medullary respiratory center. So they have nerves coming out, send signals to the diaphragm, remember, to make it contract so we can breathe in um, and have more oxygen. So whatever nerves around our body signal that we need oxygen or we have too much CO2 sends the signals to the um, those centers of the pontine and medullary to tell the rest of the muscles to contract in order to tell us to breathe in or breathe out, inhale or exhale. Okay. Now, um, these two diagrams can be confusing as well, but they're really not that confusing. It's just saying that once uh, the dorsal respiratory group, so when it's active, when you're breathing, the diaphragm contracts, the external intercostal muscles contract, um, and then there's normal quiet inhaling. Okay. So when that is not active, the opposite happens. For like three seconds, the diaphragm relaxes, the external intercostal mus muscles become less active and relax, um, and then we have quiet exhaling. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. So one's active and the other one's inactive. It's a normal, quiet breathing. Now the medullary, then we also have the, this was our dorsal respiratory group. So normal contraction, um, forceful inhalation, same thing. But then the ventral respiratory group, um, that's forceful. So we got accessory muscles um, around us trying to give a more forceful breathe into our body. So we got other muscles that are getting involved as well to inhale. So then once that happens as well, we need other muscles around it um, to, to also contract and those muscles to relax to have a forceful exhalation. So that's how it is. The ventral respiratory group is more like a forceful inhaling and exhaling. And you have accessory muscles or muscles around helping out. The dorsal respiratory is just more of a relaxed breathing. Okay. And uh, we're almost done. Uh, here's a negative feedback. So say a stimulus, something tells us that our CO2 is too high or O2 is too low, anything like that. So receptors go into our medulla or our pons near those areas, send ner nerve impulses to that center uh, to send impulses then to the muscles or the effectors to start contracting and to start breathing in or breathing out. Decrease the blood pressure, uh, or, sorry, decrease the pressure of CO2, um, increase the pH, increase the pressure of oxygen, and we go back to a normal oxygen levels or pressure, uh, normal partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, so it's just our little feedback, negative feedback. Oh, something's going on, we gotta stop that, send signals, send them out to our muscles, contract, we gotta breathe in, <sighs> we need more oxygen, okay, we're good now. So. Probably happens during exercise as well, working out a lot, running a lot. We need more, we need more, we need to stimulate that, okay? Um, so yeah. So during exercise, the system or the respiratory and the cardiovascular system adjust in response to the intensity and duration. Um, so the uh, abrupt increase in ventilation is due to neural changes that send those impulses in the medulla. Um, and then the more gradual increase uh, is due to chemical and physical changes in the bloodstream as well. So all these factors affect. So exercise is always good as well because you can work out your lungs. So think about having a bigger uh, lung volume. That means you have a bigger reserve for oxygen. That means you're going to have more oxygen flowing into the body. So there's uh, so many athletes that work out in higher altitudes and working out, technically working out their lungs to have bigger lung volume to have more oxygen inside their lungs, which is pretty cool. So that work out our lungs too, to have better, better breathing. We don't run out of breath so fast. Like right now we're, whew, I've been talking a lot. I'm running out of breath, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then with aging, through aging, airways and tissues of those tracts become less elastic. So there's less volume um, and more rigid. Uh, so it has a decreased lung capacity, so less uh, lung volume or pressure is going to be in there. And so that's why elderly people are more susceptible to pneumonia, emphysema, bronchitis, and some pulmonary disorders because they didn't really work as they used to before, okay, to kind of filter things out and inside those lungs. All right, guys, that's it, and good luck on this test. Let me know if you have any questions.